All right, we are going to get started with our keynote speaker. We have Jake Spurlock. Thank you. Um, he is going to present Mormons and Tech. Jake is a software engineer on the Wired Tech team overseeing digital, digital publishing, content management, and web performance. Prior to his work at Wired, Spurlock led web development at Maker Media, overseeing Make Magazine and Maker Fair. He has a degree in digital media from Utah Valley University, and while originally a Utah native, he currently lives in the Bay Area with his wife and three kids. Jake did offer to do two truths and a lie, but... Sorry, we don't have time. Um, just a reminder, there are these little yellow flyers out here where there is a gathering afterward. The location and everything is in it. If you would like to continue and talk and um, continue the conversation, we would love to have everybody come and um, bring a food or drink to share. But there are yellow sheets out there um, when everything's finished. Jake. Hello, and thank you for staying. I know we are all tired, hungry, and have had way too much of this, so let's just get this over with, and we can go to the after party, OK? Is Lin Lindsay's here. I just want everybody, let's give Lindsay a big hand. <laughs> Many of you know Lindsay. She's really the one behind all of this. and are behind many of the amazing things that Sunstone and other groups do. She's a great friend, and I'm really grateful for everything. So um, so today, well, I just got to back up and say, uh, last summer at the Sunstone Symposium in Salt Lake, I, I'd been bugging Lindsay for a long time. I'm like, so last year was in San Diego. We had to do it in the Bay Area. Thank you. We should do it in the Bay Area this year uh, for the selfish reason of I didn't want to have to travel to the Sunstone West Symposium. And she said, that's a great idea, and you should be the keynote. And I was like, well, that's really funny, because that's not what I signed up for. I just said, we should do it in the Bay Area. And um, somehow I got roped into this. But I do think I have something interesting to say, and um, we'll see if that's true in about 10 minutes. Um, so I work for Wired Magazine. If you're not familiar with Wired, Wired's a tech publication. It's definitely a male, upper middle class centered high household income. And what we like to talk about is um, cool gadgets and also how technology um, shapes modern living. Um, this slide here, this is the Microsoft HoloLens. Is anybody familiar with it? Maybe a few hands. The, the gist is it's an augmented reality device. Um, you wear this and then it projects in front of you um, it could be a movie, like you could like say, I want to watch a movie on this wall right here, and it will make it so that a movie is on the wall. You could put 3D modeling in front of you. It, it could do all kinds of certain things. And given this is totally a prototype right now, like it's not a commercial device, but it's something that Microsoft is working on. And it's it's really kind of the, taking the tech industry by storm. It's a really interesting product. Um, and I'm my goal here is to like look at current technology and then specifically the state of web affairs, but also look at it under the, in essence, a lens of Mormonism. This is Joseph Smith with the breastplate and looking glasses that he used to translate the Book of Mormon. Similar. Augmented reality, also in the form of Google Glass. Um, anyways, just, it's just interesting, that's all. Is anybody from not the Bay Area? A lot of, that's, that's great. Like, I'm not from the Bay Area. And so I'm kind of like fascinated by the Bay Area and Mormonism together. Um, who knows who the, the Mormon settlers in the Bay Area were? Does anybody read that one back page in the Book of Mormon that's like the map? And there's that long dotted line that goes all the way around Cape Horn, the, the Brooklyn, right? So just a, just a little bit of like, I'm the keynote, so I can talk whatever I want, OK? So we're going to talk about this for a minute. In 1846 is when the. Um, uh, July 31st, 1846, is when the first Mormon settlers uh, landed here. Well, not here, here, but like there, here, um, in Yerba Buena, which was later renamed San Francisco. Um, it took them about six months to travel from New York to San Francisco. And when they landed here, the Mexican flag was lowered. 
and the American flag was hoisted and it became an American territory. It was 1846, a couple of years later, gold was found. Anybody know the story of Sam Brannan? Kind of a cool, th that could be an entire keynote too about San Francisco Mormon history. Um, but he found like there was gold found, stuff was written, and like 140 years later, like we have another Mormon in San Francisco um, doing stuff. Um, Many, many people may not know this, but here at the Pacific School of Religion is actually where Sunstone was founded. Um, it was in 1974 when Scott Kenny, he was attending here at the PSR. He went home to the University of Utah. He was attending his the singles ward at the University of Utah when he met his uh, a friend, Peggy Fletcher Stack. Well, sorry, sorry, Peggy Fletcher at the time. Peggy Fletcher was teaching the Gospel Doctrine class. And it was between them they started this like mailing group basically, and they said, "We've got we've got ideas, we've we've got things that we need to share with people." And Scott he said, "I've been thinking of the best way to set up a communications network. This may sound far fetched to you, but here's my idea: a collaborative publication to come out at least four times a year with a rather unstructured, at least to begin with, format consisting primarily of short articles on any Mormon related subject." He said, "I envisioned an experimental journey." Uh, by and for graduate students, young professionals who are too intimidated, but intimidated by dialogues, high academic and literary standards to venture into that arena, and nevertheless had exciting experiences to share. It was incredibly naive and completely unworkable. And I like to think that I'm adding to the um, intimidated by dialogues, high academic and literary standards by just going off the cuff here. So like literally here um, is where Sunstone came from. And he, they said from mid-August to early November 1974, naming the journal, because at that time it wasn't a, a magazine, it was a journal, this quarterly journal. And naming the journal was the primary item on the agenda of our weekly and sometimes bi-weekly meetings. That task alone outlasted some of the editors. Amid much laughter, we tried the Vineyard, Rough Draft, Chrysalis, The Mormon Student, Stradivarius, Whetstone, my favorite, The Nouveau Expositor, The Harbinger, and sundry others. <clears throat> the first product that came out of Sunstone uh, then was the a Mormon history calendar. Um, it was my my understanding. It was the seventy six calendar year, but I could be wrong on this. If you know, please let me know, and it will become part of the unofficial history or something. Seventy nine before yeah, definitely before seventy nine because that's a picture of seventy seven, and that's a picture of seventy nine. So. So definitely true. This is my father-in-law, Bill, who was also here at Berkeley at the same time. Um, in January 75, Peggy Fletcher began her work in art religion here at the Graduate Theological Union. And for the next 12 years, she and Stonestone will be virtually synonymous. And in doing a little bit of research, I found this old picture of Peggy uh, with a bottle of Dr. Pepper. And it's kind of my favorite thing ever. She's a bit of a personal hero. <laughs> Um, so today, though, like, this is where my real talk kind of starts. Um, I want to talk about disruption and innovation, um, specifically about technology and Mormonism. Um, does anybody know Clayton Christensen? He's kind of famous in business circles, maybe not in academic circles like Mormonism. But he was a, went to BYU. He's Mormon. He's at Harvard Business School. And he said, a disruptive innovation is an innovation that creates a new market and value network and eventually disrupts an existing market and value network, displacing established market leaders and alliances. Um, you can think about that a lot with technology. Um, right now in San Francisco, if you need to get from point A to point B, you don't necessarily call a cab. Instead, you use Uber or Lyft. Those uh, ride-sharing economies are disrupting the, the taxi industry. The taxi industry hates it because they're, they're taking this established piece of, of economic whatever they are and saying we, there's a new leader in town and we're totally disrupting what used to be the standard. Um, you could also look further at like the camcorder <laughs> and the calculator and the calendar and, the, and your desktop phone. All of that's kind of like wrapped into an iPhone. You know? And furthermore, like with like a camera, like Kodak was totally disrupted by digital photography. So like, th there, th there's this kind of continual cycle 
of, of disruption. In fact, here in San Francisco, we there's a, another publication, not nearly as cool as Wired, but um, another publication called TechCrunch, and they have an annual event called TechCrunch Disrupt. And the entire point of, dis, uh, of TechCrunch Disrupt is to find companies that are there to disrupt. They want, they will literally prize, give awards to these companies that they can find that are going to disrupt other other economies. And it's held, and a lot of people show up. Uh, one thing to know too, just as far as disruption goes, continue like. When you're doing it right, you should be continually disrupting yourself. Um, this, you probably cannot read this at all from <laughs> the, the stand, but I'll, I'll just explain it. The red line is the iPod line, the blue line is the iPhone line, the yellow line is the iPad line, and then the green line at the bottom that's mostly flat is the Mac line. These are Apple um, unit sales. So this is how many devices Apple sells from, I can't read it, 2006 to now. So we start off, like, a lot of us remember the iPod as, like, just the most amazing technology, technological product, you know. And it just did amazing things, and it catapulted Apple, like, out of the brink of failure. Like, Apple was about to fail hard. And we feel like that's what really catapulted them to success. But when you look at the red line, it is, it is, it's gradual, but it's not a hockey stick. It's a, it's a gradual line. And then, when it hits its apex, there is a decline. And the decline comes from the disruption of the iPhone. So as product lines go, Apple, among others, are con seeking to continually create disruptive innovation. Now as we look at religion, and we look at Mormonism specifically, there's also technology that disrupts. And we're going to start with the Gutenberg Press. Uh, the Gutenberg Press was uh, the greatest project <laughs> product to come out of the 15th century. Um, instead of, you know, manually copying, you guys all know this story, instead of manually copying the Bible by hand in Latin, it was able to be mass, mass produced uh, with the press. What's that? In German, yes, thank you. Um, when we have this technological innovation, it allows for disruption. Martin Luther famously, you know, nailed his theses of why everything about the Catholic, not everything, but why many things of the Catholic Church are wrong um, up, onto, up onto the board. Um, so once again, technology, it follows disruption. Uh, next up is the Common English Press. This is something that would have been in America uh, for the printing of Poor Richard's Almanac and for the printing of leaflets and tracts that would help lead to the revolution here in America. Is Lindsay still here? Or did she go out? Because uh, I put this slide like just for her. Um, <clears throat> It's uh, John McNaughton, uh, his Clive and Bundy photo. Anyways, that's we don't need to talk about it. I mean, it's not big. Uh, the next major technology. I had to, I put this slide just for you, but don't worry about it. Okay. Yeah. The next major uh, innovation that came to printing was the Acorn Press. As we became a more industrial nation, we had better access to materials like steel rather than the wood-framed printing presses. This is what we would have had in Palmyra, um, where at the Grand Inn print shop where the Book of Mormon was printed. Now, the cool thing about the Book of Mormon is we can, we can look at this as like another form of, of disruption and innovation. Um, the Book of Mormon totally disrupted American religion. Uh, with the Book of Mormon and the, the subsequent church that was created, it totally disrupted everything. And then once again, that same technology, though, if we look back at that original definition by uh, Clayton Christensen, it allows anybody with it to disrupt anybody <laughs> with technology. And so the same tool that disrupted American religion uh, would then disrupt the original disruptor with the printing press of the Navi Expositor. So we can say that like a, a newspaper that had one issue and one just was printed one time, was then disrupted Mormonism. So we're going to fast forward a little bit and um, talk a little bit about some more current technology. I want to fast forward to 1993 because two kind of key important things happened. First was Boyd K. Packer, and this came up in the movie earlier today, that the dangers I speak of come from the gay lesbian movement, the feminist movement, and the ever-present challenge from the so-called scholars or, or intellectuals. And I just want to say hi to all of you. Um, <laughs> 
I'm so glad you're all here. So this was set in 1993, and then at the same time, Tim Berners-Lee was working on the uh, what would eventually become the Netscape web browser. So the internet had kind of been created at this point, but it, it wasn't really like what we know of what a web browser is. At this point, it was like a collection of links where you could download assets. So imagine more like FTP or something like that. Now just a couple Tim Berners-Lee quotes, because he's kind of a fascinating individual. He says, anyone who lost track of time when using a computer knows the propensity to dream, the urge to make dreams come true, and the tendency to miss lunch. And, I've, and I think about that a lot in, in, in uh, thinking about religion on the internet. Um, the propensity to dream, the urge to make dreams come true. Yeah, that's the part I'm after anyway. He said, web users also want to get at data quickly and easily. And so, like, when we're on the internet, we don't want to be slowed down. Amazon knows that by the milliseconds, like, if you can shave milliseconds off of page load times, you can increase conversions. And by increasing conversions, you make more money. And yada, yada, yada. And so Amazon sells me a lot of crap. <clears throat> also says sites need to be able to interact in one single universal space. And I think the point that uh, he's trying to make here, and I also want to make at the same time, is you cannot close out information. Information wants to be free. And the internet is a great thing for that because you can put up whatever you want and it wants to be free. So as a result, like, this is the internet. Like, we get everything we want. We do our awesome happy dance. Uh, it literally shoots rainbows at us sometimes. Um, but at the same time, the, the church has to respond to certain stuff. While many people get rainbows shot at them, um, we get the essays like Plural Marriage and Kurt Linden out here. This is what really kind of shook me really bad about a year and a half ago. Um, I had been reading, trying to like learn a lot about Joseph Smith when I came across this article at Disneyland last year. And I wanted to show uh, and hopefully highlight some of the things that the church is trying to do to uh, inoculate or um, get the message out to members. And this is, this, is, this is how they're changing things, I think, for people in the future. And I want to show you a slide here. Um, what I did was I searched for Joseph Smith polygamy. And this is with Chrome, and I'm logged into Chrome. And so Chrome knows everything. Chrome, and by, by relation, Google knows everything that I search for. They know my history. They know me better than I know myself, probably. Um, so I did a search here for Joseph Smith polygamy. Now, as we zoom in on it, the top link is josephsmithpolygamy.org. This is a Brian Hales website. It's an awesome, amazing resource of history and stuff like that about Joseph Smith. And I've been to that website before. And then the next one is Plural Marriage in Kirtland and Nauvoo, which is the church essay. And then lo list of Joseph Smith's wives. Um, so this is the Google version. This is the Google results page that I get because Google knows it's me. And just so everybody's clear, this page is built dynamically for you, like whoever requests the page. And so I'm going to do the same search again, but I'm going to use a Chrome incognito window, which basically Google, I'm not logged into Google. There's no history in the browser. In essence, it's a fresh page of a new user that's never been on the site before. So as I do it again, if you notice, the top link now is the church's essay. So the church. And, and, and I'm not trying to make this sound nefarious or anything. This is what we call search engine optimization. Like, this is not, like, I just want to be clear. I'm not trying to, like, make it sound scary or anything. Um, so the church lands the top article. And this is what they want. Because they want to be able to control the message. They, want, they don't want Brian Hale's website to be the top one. Because Brian, while Brian Hale's is a huge ally of the church and was likely part of the writing of the top article, they want to control the message. They want to be that number one spot. Now I'm going to show you one other thing, and this is something that the church cannot control. Um, so the same search lower down on the page, Google actually provides this box. It says people who also ask how many wives do Mormons have. Now this is, once again, this, is, this did not show up on my page when I did the search, but this is on the incognito page. And so outside of the church, making sure that that top link shows up, Google has said, hey, we get a lot of common search queries. And so we have this little meta box that we can put on a page that will show you what happens on common searches. Like, it'll just show you the exact answer. And so it does say, Emma took as many as 40 wives, some already married. 
and one only 14 years old. Now, related to search engine optimization, which is how your search results show up when you when people do searches, you have something called search engine SEM. Monetization? No. Yes? Okay, cool. I'm totally drawing a blank here. Search engine monetization. Now, here I did a search for Mormon stories. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's a fairly popular podcast. Some guy named Jack Delin? Anyways, I think he got asked. <clears throat> so I did a search for Mormon stories. And if you look at the top box here, that mormon.org one, that is an ad. So the church cannot, they don't want to juice the results using search engine optimization. So they do what they call search engine monetization, and they pay to put that box above that story. And to do this, and I'm just, I'm explaining this because I assume you're all not web professionals. I don't mean to sound, I'm just so we're all on the same page. So they pay, and it totally depends on the search terms and stuff like that, but it, it could be a three cent click. So if I click on that mormon.org ad, the church pays Google like three cents or five cents or a dollar or something like that, depending on what the conversion rates are. And so, once again, this is just a small example of innovation disruption that's happening in the church today and how the church wants to control that message. And they want to say, we want to be the top hit. So when you search for Mormon stories, we're going to try to bounce you over to mormon.org, just in case. So in the same kind of like vein, um, earlier today we talked about how the church used to really be able to control the message. And that's just not possible anymore. The, this, the conditions that surrounded the September 6th are something that are, right now, completely different. Um, just as an example, like between podcasts, uh, books, Mama Dragons, which are awesome, um, Facebook groups, uh, Reddit. Like, there are so many different venues for people to talk and, and form, form groups and form relationships with other people with like-minded interests. Like, I didn't know, well, I was going to say, I didn't know anything about the September 6th because I was 10 years old. Um, but a lot of people may not be shopping at the right bookstores or know the right person in their ward to talk to about stuff like this. It's now just a Google search for them. And furthermore, the message is even coming from the inside. Like this is an example from on um, Reddit, they have things called AMAs. And this is a Reddit, AMA stands for Ask Me Anything. And this is a Reddit AMA. Uh, this is a former LDS.org employer. And he said one of the things that drove him away from working for the church was when I was working on the LDS.org search and that exposed me to the essays. This is somebody that works at the church. He said there was complaint that an article was showing too high in the search results. Complaints about needing to clear stuff out of the search results wasn't too rare. Usually it's something like a dated Enzyme article, fat shaming or something. After being here for a while, I'm guessing you guys were doing a pain on those occasions. This time, though, it was just showing up too high, though. I thought it was weird at first glance because the search terms were perfectly relevant to the article. I got to reading it. It was the infamous race in the priesthood essay. I'm not sure if I need to elaborate more than that. So once again, like this is a problem that is inside the church, too. This is not, you can't say that, like, if you're in the church, you're immune to things like this, because it's happening on the inside, too. It's also external, like leaks from John DeLynn about the policy change back in November. Uh, Mitch, in a couple sessions ago, he said, do you remember where you were? I remember exactly where I was. I had just left work, and I was walking up Third Street in San Francisco, and I saw this Facebook update, and I just, <laughs> I texted Melissa right away. And I just can't believe this. So the disruption can be internal. It can be external. But the point is, it can lead towards innovation. Now, I don't know what the answer is for the church. I hope that it's love, charity, and compassion. Um, I hope that it's a better, I hope that it's a better, brighter future for LGBT people. Um, Henry Eyring, he said, some people drift when they study. But some people drift when they don't study. If the church espouses the cause of ignorance, it will alienate more people than if it advises them to seek after the truth, even at some risk. I think that the answer comes from greater education. It, um, it comes from teaching people the real truth out there. Um, 
Hubie Brown, he said, your thoughts and expressions must meet competition in the marketplace of thoughts. And in that competition, truth will emerge triumphant. Only error needs to fear freedom of expression. Um, and I really like that quote. Um, much has been said about pre-correlation, and once again, I wasn't around for that. But when you have lively discussions in gospel doctrine classes, when there are differing opinions, and when we, the, when we eliminate the polarity in the church of like, it's either true or it's not true, and we can say there's a spectrum of belief, there's a spectrum that we can work with each other and realize that we can have differing beliefs, I think that's probably where the future lies with the church. And then I also want to quote Bob Reese, who I think has left. Um, he said this earlier in his talk today, and I think this picture, he had a really strong post him or something that morning. <clears throat> but he said, no technology produces holiness. No machines are capable of giving and accepting love. But only gods and humans have hearts capable of deep and enduring love. And I'll leave that with you. Uh, is there any questions? <laughs> None? Let's get out of here. <laughs> okay, we got one. Well, we need some dentists. I don't know about lawyers. Um, I think like Cynthia's talk, like Michelle's talk earlier today, like it's all about getting people in young, teaching them that, you know, engineering isn't such a nerdy thing. I mean, it's super nerdy, but it's not so nerdy, you know? Nerdy is super cool. Um, but it's, it's teaching people young. It's showing viable career paths. Uh, when I left high school, I, I saw my ACT test the other day, and my things that I was supposed to be was a, an automotive technician, which I'm not like trying to talk down from that, but like, it was never like an idea in school to become an engineer. And so like, you know, with a little more counseling and coaching, and I think mentorships, you know, especially for the young girls, like I, I think that there's so many opportunities for women in engineering that that's a really great future. Any other questions? Yes. Can you share your faith journey in 30 seconds? Uh, <laughs> he asked me to share my faith journey in 30 seconds. And, okay, so starting right now, because I have a timer. Uh, TBM, raised in the church, went on a mission, uh, came home from a mission, got married to this lovely person right here. She's awesome. And her sister and her dad, they're both awesome too. Um, always been really into church, taught gospel doctrine for three or three years, I think. Uh, heavily involved in the scouting program. My father-in-law is a great example of that. Read some essays at the church. <laughs> Twenty-seven seconds. Yes. Thank you. In the back.
It's a good question. So I think generally the question is, is what is the church doing as far as uh, both online security and a little bit tracking and analytics and things like that? Um, I would definitely probably say that they are. Um, one thing too, just to be clear, so is everybody. I mean, like, like my day job, we're chasing our tail every day, just trying to, you know, get get the right thing, be secure, you know, work on the all the new stuff, you know, like that's what engineering is. It's one continuous job. <laughs> so, yes. And then one thing too, just as a side note, as far as cybersecurity goes, if you don't if you feel like everybody's tracking you and you don't want to be tracked, there's a great uh, plugin called GhostRoot, and it shows you every tracking script on a web page that is loading and tracking you. Um, so if you go to lds.org, you'll see Omniture, Google Analytics, blah, 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 along with Wired or any other site. So if you don't like that, there's easy ways to check it out. And it's called Ghostery. Ghost, E-R-Y. So just Google Ghostery, install it, and you will be a lot more secure. Yes, sir. Gabby Blair, who is here, is a big web presence, and you've gone to church conferences and consulted with that church about its online presence. So if you could say to answer this question. My, um, when I heard this question, my first thought was, oh, we're definitely just trying to catch up. I mean, yeah. based on my experience at Bong Com conferences, mm -hmm. it's, oh, I mean, it's for sure. And every, again, like you said, everyone's trying to. You see, you see the technology happening, you're like, oh, how do we, how do we get ahead in, search, in searches? How do we get ahead in... One of my favorite, um, I have an uncle that works for the church, and one of my one of the coolest things that I've ever seen online is the genealogy fan charts that you can find from LDS.org. Like, it's a beautiful UI. Like, I don't want to say that the church is doing bad things. They are doing some amazing things online. And one thing that I what didn't plan on putting in my talk, um, but there is an amazing, if you go to tech.lds.org, there are lots of opportunities for open source, well, I shouldn't say open source, for projects that the church is working on that they need you, people's help with. So that includes the scripture apps if you're iOS developer. That includes, at one point in time a couple years ago, I worked on, um, I worked on building the DC Lights uh, website. So the Washington DC Temple had a special website and I helped work on that. And so there are a lot of opportunities, both in genealogy, both in UI projects, um, app development, lots of projects. Any other questions? No? Awesome. Well, thank you all very much. Once again, for coming to Sunstone. Thank you to Lindsay. Thank you to everybody.